Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast, My First Season. My name is Greg, and we have a very special guest today for you. This will be part three in a series of amazing women doing amazing things. Today's guest is a pop culture geek with 17 years in the travel industry as a travel consultant and tour director. She's the owner and operator of the Geek Travel Agent, which is creating travel magic. Her mission to create unique travel experiences for fans, connecting them to the destinations that inspire their favorite books, music, movies, and TV shows. If you have passion for pop culture and need a travel consultant who knows the difference between the North and the Shire, then you are in the right place. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone, please help me welcome today's guest from Ottawa, Canada, Erin Novodvorsky. Hey, Erin, how are you? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Good. Did I nail your last name or did I? You did. Up? Very good job. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've only been practicing it all night. Okay. <laughs> it's a tough one. Got some. It's, it's very uh, phonetic when you read it out. A couple of V's, a lot of N's in there. Okay. Yeah, the D and the V beside each other throw a lot of people off. Yeah, yeah I had to split it down the middle. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So I guess what we usually do here is, uh, before we talk about your first season in, in the travel consulting business, is uh, you were, I guess, born and raised in Ottawa? Yep. I'm I'm definitely an Ottawa city girl. Uh, and uh, no, it's, I just live, well, mostly Nepean actually would be the technical part of the city of where I live uh, or lived. Yeah, just suburban kid. I've lived my whole life in uh, in Nepean, except for a, a small stint, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, six months overseas in, in London, England. Um, and then just recently moved out to Carlton Place, for those who know the Ottawa area, which is about 40 minutes west of, of the city. But yeah, I've, I've always lived in, uh, lived in Ottawa, and it really is a great place to live. It's not as boring as people think it is. And uh, how old were you when you got bit by the travel bug? Oh, I was, I was pretty young. My first airplane ride was, I was about 15, I think, just off to a girl guide camp in Toronto. But uh, the first countries I really sort of knew about that were on my radar, I was very, very young. Um, my mom has a Scottish pen pal that she's been writing to since she was 14. So that was, you know, someone who's always been in my life. And my grandfather uh, was a, a Korean, is a Korean war vet. So Korea and Scotland were two countries that I knew of, you know, they were the only countries I knew of other than Canada from, you know, right from being a small child. So I think very early on, I had a real interest in, in what those places were like. And yeah, very, very quickly travel club in high school. I had the chance to go on two trips with that. And that just really set that off. And, and I travel a lot with girl guides. Or I used to travel a lot with girl guides as well. So two really big things affected my life that way for travel. And when exactly did you become a pop culture geek? Were you always um, from the time you were young into definitely, uh, sci fi and everything like that? Yeah, I definitely grew up on uh, Next Generation. I'm definitely a kid of the 90s for sure. Next Generation is really my my entry point into sci fi and Star Wars. I remember every March break, I would take a day uh, to like sit in my parents' bed and, you know, with my pajamas on watching TV uh, or watching all three original Star Wars movies. That was, you know, I wanted to be Princess Leia when I grew up. That kind of, that all kind right. Of, so, okay. Yeah, I, I was so, going to ask you what your, are you original trilogy or are you the, you know? Oh, oh the, no, I was uh, definitely original that, trilogy for okay, sure. Okay, uh, that <laughs> that was my, I definitely grew up on that a hundred percent, like had the VHS tapes and, you know, wore them out. So <laughs> Uh, so definitely grew up, yeah, Next Generation and and Star Wars were my first really two big things I got into. But, you know, the X-Men cartoon was on TV after school and I loved Jubilee, just things like that. It was just sort of always around, just mostly with, with television. I was not a big comic book kid, but I was always aware of stuff like that. I don't even remember the really cheesy 90s TV show, Lois and Clark. Yes. Um, with like Dean Kane as Superman. I loved that show as like a tween. So <laughs> that was huge for me. Yeah, stuff like just stuff like that. I was always really aware of it. And then later on got more into into books and then books getting turned into movies, that kind of thing. And your your girlfriends growing up, were they did they have the same uh, interests and passion as you, or were you kind of unique in that? You I think I was a little bit unique in that. I didn't really, I wasn't one of those people who always had like a best friend. I definitely uh, had sort of a wider circle. So there was always somebody to talk to uh, about the the shows and stuff. But like my brother uh, definitely was the one who who would sit down after school and watch like the original Star Trek, which I thought was just so boring at the time as like a seven-year-old. Can we watch something else? Um, but he he really influenced me that way with, with getting into Star Trek and is still, you know, super, super into that as well. Are you saying though now you have a 
appreciation for the uh, the original I series? I definitely have an appreciation for the original series. I love sort of all the, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a doctor, Jim, you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> um, you know, William Shatner is, is phenomenal. Uh, you know, Leonard Nimoy was just, you know, amazing. Um, the, the barriers that Star Trek, the original Star Trek broke um, within culture, not just pop culture, um, was, were really important. Like, especially, you know, um, Kirk and Uhura's, um, the first, you know, interracial kiss, that kind of thing. I think looking back on it, even though I haven't seen every episode, I definitely get all the memes <laughs> with the, yes. the tribbles and the tribbles and everything. So well, that first interracial. Yeah, I, I think it's it, the original Star Trek is definitely, yeah, that first interracial kiss was supposed to be between Leonard Nimoy and Uhura, but uh, Kirk stole it. Oh, William well, Shatner you know, as, yeah. as Kirk would. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that kind of thing, I think, is very sort of under underappreciated by people who aren't, you know, in sort of the pop culture sphere. Um, and even things like, you know, communicators. And now we have touch, you know, all the touch screen, you know, tablets and everything we could ever want. But we all saw that on on Star Trek first. Some people really don't don't think of that or it doesn't register if they were never um, Star Trek fans. Yes, exactly. Now you attended the University of Ottawa. You have a bachelor's in sociology. Your field of study was international development and globalization, and you graduated mm-hmm. with distinction. So I work at a university, so I know how hard it is because you you attended part time while working full time. So while you were, is that when you did you start your travel business while you were a student at the University no. of Ottawa? No, I actually, so I went to Algonquin College for travel and tourism, uh, which is you know, probably the, you know, the premier college you know, in the region um, here in Eastern Ontario. And that was a two-year program I took right out of high school. So I was the last grade 13 class for anyone who, who knows that Ontario used to have five years of high school and then it went down to four. So there was two graduating classes all at one time back in, that was in 2003. So I went to college right after high school and did that and got into working with a small um, tour operator here in Ottawa um, called Ottawa Valley Tours. And that's where I started tour directing as well. And then after a few years there, I decided I wanted to be more on the travel agent side of things and found another small company <laughs> uh, and went and worked uh, worked there for a few years before finally um, joining TPI, which is Travel Professionals International. And they're a Canadian company that is the sort of the back office, head office for independent travel agents all across the country. There's like 900 of us or something like that. So I started with TPI independently on my own in 2014. So I sort of had, you know, without having the other two jobs previous to this, uh, I wouldn't be able to do it on my own for sure. Now, when did you get the idea to specifically target pop culture geeks? Like for instance, you organize tours to Scotland for mm-hmm. any out, Outlander fans, which I want to yep. talk to you later about Outlander. So, <laughs> so when, when did you get the idea? So I think it was around 2017. Um, I, was, uh, I was really interested in sort of trying to figure out how to bridge the gap between pop, the, all the pop culture stuff that I love. Like I was, you know, traveling to go to, you know, Fan Expo and, and all the Comic Cons here and, and bridging tourism. And I knew that there was stuff around because there were people, I was already booking, you know, for people to go to uh, um, Harry Potter World uh, and, uh, you know, the Warner Brothers Studio Tour. Um, so there were people already interested in traveling and I was already helping people do that as a part of a larger trip. So I knew that there was a market for it for sure. And it just really in 2017, I, I had a, I, I was in a business networking group and there was a business coach there who really knew the travel industry as well and and gave me the confidence to really go for it saying like this is a good idea you should do this and so that was you know 2017 2018 um that I really decided okay like let's let's give this a go and it was only in the past few weeks that my branding got finished so it's been a long journey it's a bit of bit of a break in there uh during COVID as I'm sure many many travel agents uh, experienced but yeah, 2017, 2018 was when I really sort of started gathering all the ideas and, and writing out like, you know, where people can go, what they can do. And also that's when I saw the tour operators themselves really focusing on destination travel based on movie locations, um, movie filming locations and and things related to books and movies. It's always been a genre that people sort of know about, like, you know, people go to Graceland, people go to Abbey Road, like that's related to, to fandom and to pop culture, but people don't think it's weird, you know, for someone to go to Abbey Road, but they still think it's a little like, oh, you'd go all the way to New Zealand for Lord of the Rings. Like, 
you know, there's, there's still a bit of a stigma there, but it's a huge, huge niche that I think people really are taking to. I had such good, good feedback at, at Comic-Con this past weekend. Okay. Yes. We're going to talk about um, Ottawa Comic-Con, which you attended mm-hmm. from November 19th to the 21st. Yeah. We, I definitely want to have some questions about that later. So would you say you had a, if I asked you what was your most popular Travel destination, I guess, for, for geeks, would it be the, the, the Shire or the North, like the Game of Thrones? Do you I have think one? There's, yeah, th- there's definitely a lot of interest in New Zealand. Um, obviously, in the past couple of years, there haven't, haven't had the chance to go because it's been so closed off. The most interest I've really had, though, for people who are, you know, chomping at the bit to book is to go to Japan um, for all of the anime and video games. Um, and the traditional culture that's there as well. But, um, but you know, I'm sure you know that anime at Comic-Cons is just it's a huge portion of it. So that's really has a lot of people's attention to, to go to Japan and, and multi-generational too. Like it's parents taking their kids. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, and Game of Thrones has been, has been mostly couples, like adult couples. So, which is, which is fantastic. I had an anniversary couple go to Northern Ireland and, and do, you know, a, some of the Game of Thrones stuff up there as well. Uh, and of course, Scotland is popular for, you know, all different types of, uh, of travelers uh, and uh, just perpetually interesting. So that, that's always been a, a draw for a lot of people as well. Now with but the yeah, new- Japan definitely has the most attention right now. Now, with the new show of uh, Game of Thrones coming out on HBO, House of Dragon, next year, do you anticipate a renewed uh, interest in the uh, I think so, yeah. Cause it's definitely died down a little bit. Like, obviously, at, at conventions, like, you still have, you know, you still see the stuff on people's tables that they've made related to Game of Thrones, but you don't see anyone, like, you know, dressing up as Jon Snow anymore. So it's definitely, you know, had a bit of, you know, fading away. But I think that might be, might be a bit of Robert Jordan, or not, sorry, not Robert Jordan, that's another side of things. George, um, George, R. George R. R. Martin. Martin's, yeah, George R. R. Martin's fault in a way because he hasn't finished, you know, and, the actual Game of Thrones series. Isn't it, isn't it crazy? We had a pandemic where everybody did something new and and did that chore they've been putting off. You thought we thought for sure, okay, it's a pandemic. Right. He, he can't go anywhere. He's got nothing he, else to do. He's gonna finish. <laughs> and did he? apparently nope. he's like a hunt and peck typer and still is using like some yes. sort of like. Commodore 64. Yes, exactly. It's not, like, it's, not, it's not hooked up to the internet. So there's no. I feel like he could just dictate to someone and it would get out a lot faster. He, he even has a website. There's two people, um, um, uh, husband and wife run, run a website because he forgets the color of the horse's eyes. And he he actually emails them to ask them what he wow. wrote. And, uh, but yeah, you'd think he would have finished this darn book <laughs> but, during the pandemic, but nope. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I'm sure he must have, you know, have broken some sort of like publishing contract he has at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, sure, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I've I've read the first four, and then I decided, oh, I'm just gonna watch the show, and then when he finishes the books, I'll catch up on the books. And I've got book five sitting on my shelf; haven't read it yet. I've had it for who knows, like it came out in like I think 2013 because I bought it on a trip to Australia, <laughs> so thinking I was gonna read it on the way back, and no, it's still sitting on my shelf. I'm just sort of like waiting for myself even to get back into it and to be to be energized by it again. But before the show came out, I'd see a lot of people reading these books on the metro, and I always you know shook my head at them and i felt bad for them because you know these books are monstrous right there's 1200 yeah, pages yeah. and i'm just you know i couldn't and then of course when the first uh, series came out i devoured i devoured it and then i bought all the books so i was finally one of those people that you know just on the bus <laughs> yep i uh, was yeah i was there with them and then i became the that guy that at the office it was like actually in the books i was that guy, <laughs> yeah you know? oh yeah <laughs> and but my husband and i were watching the show together and he hasn't read the books um and i was just like well that was different from the book and like i am I'm that person every time I see it somewhere on TV or a movie that I've been to him I was like I've been there my my husband and my friends probably hate me for it at this point okay yeah you also organized K-pop tours, so Korean pop yeah. culture I'm guessing Squid Game uh, kind of went went through the roof for you did you get any um, people wanting it's to actually go to Korea? more the K-pop side of things than the K-drama side of things oh okay um but but yeah absolutely the the uh, Korean tourist board is really on top of um you know, promoting the shows that have been filmed there and even have brochures that they've given me about two particular shows that are on Netflix that are not Squid Game. Um, Because Squid Game was mostly filmed on a set. So uh, you can't really visit the set except some some YouTuber just built it for like millions of dollars. I saw Yeah, yeah, he did. Maybe you can visit the set now. (laughs) But uh, but the the shows that um, 
the Korean tourist board is really promoting that were filmed in Korea uh, are Goblin, um, which has a much longer title, uh, and Mr. Sunshine, which is a, a historical drama. Um, Goblin was also partly filmed in Quebec City. So I've actually met Korean tourists in Quebec City uh, on the Petit Chemin plane, taking pictures of like the door that's there because it's in that K-drama. So you don't have to go very far. You don't have to go all the way to Korea to experience like K-drama filming locations. So, which is, that was fascinating to, to be in Quebec City and be like, oh my God, this is where they, this is where they filmed it. That's kind of odd, no? Like normally they would shoot entirely in Korea, don't they? That they would No, because a, like, a lot of K-dramas actually do take place in multiple countries. Two or three I can think of off the top of my head, one even filmed in, uh, in Switzerland. So it, like they, they are very, very global productions. Uh, so yes, of course, most, you know, most of that, if they take place in Korea, they're obviously filmed in Korea. But yeah, there's another one I think filmed in, in Greece as well. So they, they are massive productions. I think people don't understand how big the Korean entertainment industry is. People understand how big Bollywood is. You know, they, they get it. They know it's a huge, huge thing. They, they, there isn't an awareness yet um, in the general population of how big the Korean entertainment industry is. Well, I recently watched My Name also, more of a, a K-drama. I don't know if you watched mm-hmm. My Name, but ex- excellent as well. So I uh, I haven't I, watched I, that one yet. No, very good. but Highly I recommend. mean, there's there's hundreds. So. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm starting to see that more and more on Netflix, <laughs> like Hellbound. I just saw Hellbound's a new yep. thing you have to watch. I haven't got into that yet. The thing that's great about them, though, is that they're one season and the story's over. Like it's done. You have closure at the end of, you know, 16 to, to 30 episodes and that's it. And you can move on. And I think that's brilliant. It, it's so much better to me than than having a cliffhanger and waiting 10 months for season two or not even knowing if it's going to get re- renewed. The, it's, it's a much better for people like me who want the closure, who want the ending and the payoff. It's there. It's a phenomenal way to watch TV. Now, earlier you mentioned you spent six months in London, England. So what prompted mm. that that move? So I've been uh, I've been a girl guide since 1989. So really? So what I, level? What level are there? Levels of girl guides? Like what, there what? are. So um, there's sparks, brownies, guides, pathfinders, rangers, and then leaders. Uh, so from sparks to rangers, that ranges from age five to age 18, uh, and then leaders, you know, 18 plus, you can be in it your whole life. Uh, so I've been in it since uh, since I was a spark. So since I was about five years old, uh, and now I'm a, a pathfinder and ranger leader. But Girl Guides has, well, I should say the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts has four permanent centers around the world that have, have been in existence since, you know, as early as 1932. And the most recent one was built in, in the 1960s. And you can actually go and volunteer at them and live at them. And they kind of run like youth hostels, but also like conference centers. So it's, it's the two things sort of mixed together. And so I was a volunteer house assistant. That was the name of the position, which was open to any member of guiding or guiding uh, between the age of sort of 18 and 25. So I was 21 when I was there uh, and it was just an incredible experience, you know, living in London for free because uh, we lived at the Girl Guide Center and the, my coworkers were people from all over the world, uh, some of whom I'm still very, very close with, you know, from Australia and, and Germany and all of the United States. So it's, uh, you know, and, and other countries as well. So it's just, a, it was an amazing experience. And uh, I, I learned a lot and never worked so hard physically in my life as I did when I was there. And just, you know, it's, it's a really, really unique experience that, uh, that I hope, you know, more, uh, more members of guiding and scouting take advantage of. Well, how long, how many years does it take to go from a spark to a ranger leader, roughly? So from of sparks to rangers is age five to age 18. Uh, and you can be a leader as soon as you turn 18, basically. So I, I started out when I was 19, a spark unit needed a leader in order for the unit to still exist. So I became a spark leader at 19. And then just on and off since then, I mean, I'm, I'm 30, I'll be 37 on Monday. So, you know, I've been a leader basically since since then, you know, on and off throughout, uh, you know, my whole adult life so far. Okay. Wow. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> now, do you have any, I, I love, since I, I traveled for 10 years and a lot of my listeners do, do you have any, uh, it could be, it could have happened to you. It could have happened to your tour group. Do you have any travel horror stories like, or some, or, or an ex- something that you planned went wrong, but I mean, it's okay so, to talk about, obviously if it's appropriate, yes, but, you know, yes, so, have, does anything uh, come to mind like that? A hundred percent. Um, okay. I have something I called the hurricane tour. So okay. do you remember, I, believe it was, I can't remember if it was 20, I think it was 2018 or 2019, Hurricane Dorian hit the East Coast and it was 
it was a pretty bad hurricane. Well, I, I've, I've actually been through a few hurricanes working in the uh, resort yeah. industry. So, <laughs> well, yeah, yes. yeah, from, from, yeah, Club Med, yeah. Yes. Um, they, they, yeah, hurricane area. So I was actually doing a, a nine-day tour of the East Coast during Hurricane Dorian. So we were in Summerside with when the hurricane really hit, uh, hit hard, and a tree fell on our tour bus at, as you know, it was parked in the, in the hotel parking lot. Fortunately, the staff at the hotel in Summerside were amazing and they got out ladders and chainsaws and got, got the tree off of our bus. But then we were supposed to be leaving the island that day. The ferry from the island over to Cape Breton was canceled. So we couldn't get off the island that way. So we had to reroute the whole itinerary to get to where are we going. We were going to Bedeck to get to Bedeck from Summerside in a day. But the other problem was that the Confederation Bridge was open and closed sort of on and off because of the high winds because high sided vehicles can't go across the uh, confederation bridge if the winds are up over a certain a certain speed which makes a lot of sense so we my driver had the app and he saw that the bridge was open and so we corralled all of the passengers got them onto the bus within about half an hour with all their luggage and drove straight to the bridge and got across or got onto the bridge the bridge closed to all traffic, the car, like two cars after us. So not only like were high sided vehicles, you know, shouldn't have been on the bridge at that time, but no vehicles were allowed on the bridge. You know, so there's one car behind us and that was it. We were basically like white knuckle across the bridge the entire time. And I, the whole time I was just thinking, how do I open the emergency windows? Because if we're going to go over into the strait, I'm going to have to try and get some people out of the bus in the water. And, and I like, it was the scariest thing I've ever encountered really. And what was even scarier is that a transport truck had been let across from the other side. So at one point, like in the middle of the bridge, we had the transport truck and the tour bus passing each other in hurricane winds. And I, I thought we were going to go over the edge. When we got to the other side, the everyone on the bus applauded, just like burst into like this joyous, like applause of safety and our driver my driver Sarah is just one of the most incredible drivers he you know within a few minutes pulled over he's like I just need to get out of the bus and I was like yep all of us need to get out of the bus for a minute so and we had beautiful sunny skies all the way back through New Brunswick and back over to uh to Bedeck but yeah it was it was rearranging things the whole time you know were we going to stay an extra night in Bedeck because the hotel in Halifax didn't have any power it was just a snowball effect and I put that one on my resume because that was probably one of the most most difficult but most interesting tours I've ever had to direct and just definitely uh I have a wealth of experience from that from that one nine day nine day trip it was uh yeah it was incredible are you saying Anne, Anne of Green Gables got you dead I mean why, why were you touring the east coast actually I don't know where Anne of Green Gables is from but I think it's oh, no, very, like, yeah, why, yeah. what, what, what yeah. were you doing was this for a specific pop culture or, um... No, this was actually with Ottawa Valley Tours, which is okay. the, the tour company I worked with uh, originally when I was right out of college. And then I, I worked with them um, as a, you know, just a freelance tour director um, for the past few years, right up until uh, the pandemic. And uh, it was it's one of their um, sort of trips that they run a few times a year. And they uh, they needed a tour director for that one. And I got the call. So and I actually only got the call two days before the trip left because the tour director who was supposed to go ended up having to go in the hospital quite suddenly. So I wasn't even supposed to be on that trip originally, but, but it was, it was an amazing experience as scary as it was. And as, as, uh, as dangerous as it could have been, um, you know, everyone got home safe and that was the important thing. Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Now you attended Ottawa Comic-Con on November 19th, 2021. Now, was this mm. your first time on the other side, say as a vendor, as opposed to a My fan? second time, my second time, which is, uh, my first one was at Fanaticon 2, which is a, a convention, uh, another local convention here in Ottawa. They've had this, Fanaticon 2 was the second one. It was in September. Fanaticon 3 is next summer uh, in August. Uh, I'm signed up for that one too. So Comic-Con this past weekend was, yeah, my only, my second time behind the table instead of, you know, in perusing them. Uh, and it was my first three-day convention as well. So, just, you know, it's been a while since I had to be on my feet for eight hours a day. So that, that was a, a, you know, shocking reminder of how much your feet can hurt at the end of a convention day. Uh, but it was, 
it was a really great experience. I'm really, really glad I did it and looking forward to the next one too. Well, because of COVID, I haven't attended one in two years. So what was the uh, majority of the cosplay like? Was there a, th- was there a recurring theme in the cosplay? Was there a lot of anime? Stuff? Okay. Yeah, a lot of anime. My friend who who ran the booth with me uh, is a big anime watcher. And I I need desperately need to catch up because I'm, I'm not huge into anime. Uh, and she was like telling me the names of all the shows in Japanese because she speaks Japanese uh, and telling me all the characters. So there was definitely one character and I, I know people who listen to this who know anime will recognize it. It's a character in like a black and green checkered shirt. There are probably about at least five or six people each day dressed in as that character. And I'm sorry that I can't remember the name. Are of you the saying anime this character, or, or character? Are you saying this character has replaced Sailor Moon? Is this what you're telling me? I don't think I saw okay. any Sailor Moon. What? Okay. okay. I know. I, don't know, I know. Okay. It's and there was like lots of like My Hero Academia, which is one that I do know. Um, and you know, Mortal Kombat was always there. You know, Pyramid Head, as always. You know, Santa Pyramid Head. Uh, the 501st Legion, which is the um. Yes. The Stormtrooper Legion. They were they were there, and some of them were were decked out more in uh, in Christmas themed uh, stuff. And and the Doctor Who Society was there. So you know all all those usual characters. Um, there's one woman who dressed up as a different River Song every day, and she was incredible. Like she was so nice. She came up to the booth and everything, and and she just she like it was just the epitome of like the perfect River Song cosplay. Um, all three days. So that was amazing. Uh, but I think, you know, all the usual, you know, the usual c- culprits were always there, but uh, definitely it was very heavily anime for sure. And not so much um, fantasy, though there was one gentleman dressed in full plate armor. So that was amazing. Okay. And I assume uh, everyone had to wear masks. Uh, yes. Were... Yeah. Okay. So everyone, um, everyone coming in and all the vendors had to show proof of vaccination and everyone had to be masked the entire time as well, uh, except for in small designated areas where their food consumption was allowed. So uh, all the protocols were, were re- really well kept. People were keeping their distance. Like people were spreading out. Like if, if there were people already at a booth, people would move on and come back. Like we could see that happening. People were, were, were spreading out. Like we had, um, I had like an interactive piece to my booth where you could put like a sticker, you know, on what travel experience you wanted. And I had a hand sanitizer there and people were really thankful because, you know, they just, they recognized that everyone was trying to be, be courteous and be safe. And that was, I think the big thing I noticed was, was just the courtesy we're really, really lucky here that everyone was really making an effort to, to really follow, follow the rules and, and to have a good time, you know, despite any sort of restrictions and rules. I saw, I saw the photos you posted on your Facebook page with that interactive um, kind of map or destination. So what, what, at the end of the three days was which, which one had the most stickers? So the pint at the green dragon in New Zealand beat Studio Ghibli in Japan by one vote. Okay. <laughs> so uh, very, very close. I had, I think one had 68 votes and the other had 67 votes. So yeah, so definitely New Zealand and Japan um, had the most interest. And I ran out of uh, Japan brochures. So, okay. you know, so that was, yeah, definitely. Again, Japan is, uh, was right up there. Uh, but it, yeah, it was a great experience. Really, really well run, uh, you know, well organized. And, uh, you know, they just, they made it easy. And the EY Center is, is huge. If anyone hasn't been there, it's a massive convention center right near the airport in Ottawa. Uh, and the holiday edition of Comic-Con only had sort of half of the half of the space, um, but the regular sort of summertime Comic-Con has the entire building. I don't know how many tens of thousands of square feet it is, but it's huge. Okay, now uh, let's get into Outlander, some chopping at mm. the bit. So I'm just curious, like, so you, so the tours to Scotland to see the stones. Now, let me preface this just by saying I'm not ashamed at all to declare my love for ABBA or Gilmore Girls. I'm a lifelong love Gilmore Girls, but I'm (gasps) deeply, deeply embarrassed to say, and I don't admit it often, that I watch Outlander. And I think we should all be ashamed of ourselves watching the show. Now, here's why. Because, (laughs) well, I think Outlander is made for uh, people who like men, so I'm not going to say I'm not going to say I'm not going to say it's a chick show because it's for anyone <laughs> who likes <laughs> men. Okay, whatever your thing is. Yes, um, who likes certain scenery. <laughs> so I uh, and I think the way they treat uh, historic, like uh, Claire r- bumps into George Washington, it's like <laughs> it's George Washington. You know, there's no um, yeah no shock and awe. Like if you really did go 
you know, back in time. And by the way, when they touch the stones, we never get to see what happens. So that drives me crazy. So, I know. Um, so you know, feel a little slight more sci-fi in there. Do you know a lot of men that watch this show or, or, or I do know, women? I do know a few, a few men who watch the show. Okay. Um, but I think you really have to sort of, uh, you know, read into and, and read, uh, see what, um, both oh, Sam Hewen and uh, Diana Gabaldon have said, and that is that the, the, sh- the books and the show were created from the female gaze. Uh, and they've been very, you know, it was very explicit about that. And Sam Hewen was, you know, spoke really eloquently about it. And he said, you know, like the show was written by a woman, the book was written by a woman for women or for those who, who you know, like men. Uh, and it was really, um, she really pays attention to, to that aspect of it. In one respect, it is a smutty romance novel um, with history thrown in. So, so I'm glad that it's being treated like that on TV um, because there's a lot on TV that isn't smutty romance. And I feel like, you know, we have how many versions of NCIS are there? How many versions of Law and Order? How many versions of Doctor and, and you know, police and, and, you know, different types of hero shows are there? You, there, you can name hundreds. How many truly smutty romance novel series TV shows can you name? Not many. And well, you do bring right? up a good point. I believe the actor Sam Hewen was solely created, you know, for the female gaze because, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, the, or the gaze of anyone who likes, you know, likes men and likes Sam Hewen. Uh, so it, um, but yeah, it, it's true. Like that it does, it was written for a certain audience. And that audience I feel is very underserved in, in TV in general. And, uh, and, you know, the fact that it's a, uh, it's a man being sexualized instead of a woman being sexualized is unique on TV, you know, on mainstream television. So I have no problem with this. <laughs> as, no, no, as, no, no. You know? <laughs> nor, nor should you. Now, have you read the, no. all the books? Have you read all the books? I have not read all the books. And okay. I, I, I have to admit this. I love Scotland. And I have been to Scotland um, a couple of, well, three, three, four times. I have Scottish heritage as well as Irish heritage. It, and again, with my mother's pen pal being Scottish, we've got a really close connection to Scotland. I've read the first book and I'm still getting through all the seasons. My mom has read all of them and is a history major. So she really is like, oh, they did this. They've gone here. Like she she really loves the history of it as well, which I know has been sort of brushed over in some respects. You know, like you said, like there's no surprise to meeting George Washington, which you would think there would be because it's like, oh, my God historical figure it's almost like claire is desensitized to yeah. everything she's experiencing in a certain way yes now i have a i have a question or maybe uh, to, to get your your point of view on it and the the very first uh, season the first episode mm-hmm. starts with what looks to be <laughs> a scottish person outside claire's claire's hotel so is the yeah. author playing the long a really long con here or a long game like are we ever going to find out like oh I, yes i mean yes. Bra- bravo if that's what you're doing because the uh, six, oh, no, the, the six season long, comes out comes out next yeah. year on march 6th so here we are six seasons in and that scene has never never been explained in six years actually more because we have what we what's called the drought lander where they do yeah, actually yes. <laughs> more, than, more than a year in between seasons that you have have to wait so I, I, I love I love when these periods of, of drought between <laughs> seasons for different shows get names because I, I yeah. think there was like the same thing for Supernatural as well and and like for for Sherlock and all like they all have like you know they're <laughs> the abyss of no new material well the Droughtlander whoever coined that is brilliant because oh, yeah, that, that, yeah. Uh, okay so you're saying there will be at one point an explanation That's to- my understanding from my mother you know, okay. <laughs> I have to, I have to give all credit to my mother here because she knows um, it, it's, there is a payoff for it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Because wow, they're really taking their time on that one. And yeah. Hats the, off the, thing, the thing I find really interesting is that I've had, I've had friends and, and clients be like, Oh, I want to go to Inverness because you know, like that's, you know, the 1940s Inverness is so prominent in the show. And I was like, yes, but it wasn't filmed in Inverness. Inverness doesn't look like that anymore. So, and I think that's where the, the tours really came about is that we see this, this version of Scotland uh, on, you know, on screen and then, but to actually go to the places that, that you want to look like that isn't the actual place necessarily. Uh, and I think that's really sort of pulls the curtain back for a lot of people. And you still get this amazing experience of seeing 
really historical villages uh, and beautiful cities and everything um, and realizing, ah, okay, this was the double for that. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's still magical. What, what actual places does the tour hit like from from the show like just off offhand any castles any uh yeah uh, yep yeah. all the all the main ones that you would think of so the uh the castle that's jamie's um jamie's family home that castle's on there the um well, we go, you know, down to Fort William, which is, you know, a big feature of the show as well. Uh, over to Sky. Sky is the opening, the opening cr uh, credit scene where you see Jamie and Claire on the horse, like riding down, uh, down the Glen. That's on the Isle of Sky. So Isle of Sky is on the itinerary as well. It actually goes all the way up to the Orkneys. It's a phenomenal itinerary. It's, it's on my website. It's, it's a, and it's actually done by. I can't take credit for it. Trafalgar, which is a very, you know, well-known uh, tour company. They, I actually tried to create an itinerary on my own. And then I looked at theirs and I was like, no, this is perfect. They've done a really good job creating this itinerary. So I basically am, am promoting their tour and I have reserved seats on a specific departure for you know me and my mom and all of our friends to go and whoever wants to join us. So uh, it, it's a great itinerary for people who don't know anything about Outlander too, because it's such a good tour of Scotland that it really goes, you know, it hits, you know, all the major cities like Edinburgh, uh, Glasgow, uh, Aberdeen, or sorry, not Aberdeen, it skips Aberdeen, goes to Inverness, <laughs> um, all through the Cairngorms. You do go to Culloden um, Battlefield and, and the museum, which I was there in 2014, and it's an incredible museum, um, over to the West Coast, and then all the way up north uh, and into the Orkneys, so up to a stay in Thurso. So it really does a Real, uh, other than Aberdeen, it does a really good tour of, of Scotland. All right. One last question about Out, Outlander, and then I'm going to mm. get off it and stop complaining. They, uh, the, last, okay. the last season, they tweaked the theme song, which I did not like. I prefer the original. <laughs> What's your thoughts on that? I'm original all the way. So okay, my my friend who who ran the booth with me, she made a playlist for the booth and the Outlander theme song was on there, but original only, original all the way. Yeah, why would you mess with something that nice? I no, mean, it's iconic. Heck? Like, like you, like I'm sure, like you can like sing the Gilmore Girls theme song off the top of your head. Like it's one I of those can. things. Like you just, yeah, like oh me too. Uh, I, on I think. The road. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen all episodes of Gilmore Girls three times, uh, at Ooh, least. Good. Um, so again, we get, a, like, we get a tour to Stars Hollow, please. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Apparently it was actually based off of Unionville, yes, Toronto. That's right. So which I which I was there for a dance competition many, many years ago. And but even like other small towns like Gananoque, Ontario has has a uh, a gazebo in a beautiful little park. And I took a picture of it one time and sent it to my friend. And I was like, it looks like Stars Hollow. <laughs> so, so there's a few really pretty Ontario towns that look a little bit like Stars Hollow. Yeah, I think because yeah, Amy Sherman Palladino, I think she was she was traveling and she she mm -hmm. went by one of these towns and that's where she got the idea. Uh, oh yeah, it. and and that whole area down um, where it's you know supposed to take place is is a really really beautiful area of like sort of like southern Connecticut, New Hampshire, you know, like down along that you know that whole little coast there is is really really beautiful area. All right. Are you watching anything currently that my listeners should watch? Like, I hope you're watching Arcane League of Legends, because if you haven't, this show is amazing. It's fantastic. It's on Netflix. And even if you I, don't play the game, you don't have to. I don't play the game. I cannot speak. I've, I've, I've heard of it. I have not watched it's it. It's brilliant. We, Please get into it. We just started watching Hawkeye last night. Oh, um, yes. Of course. Yeah. We're, my husband and I are both Marvel fans as well. And the other thing I'm watching, which I flubbed a name earlier is the wheel of time. Oh yes. Um, On Amazon so, prime. Ro yeah. With Rob Robert Jordan's books. So I started reading those when I was 16. Um, it's for people who liked game of Thrones, but want to be able to watch it with, you know, younger family members, not children, but you know, yeah, like because those uh, Trollocs or whatever are pretty scary looking. Trollocs give you know give kids <laughs> some nightmares. But yeah, it's definitely sort of like a sixteen plus as opposed to an you know an eighteen or twenty one plus kind of show. They did age up the characters a little bit, which I don't mind. It makes sense for for the for the show. Some people would be like, no, Egwene is supposed to be 14, but, <laughs> but she's obviously, you know, an older, older teenager, young, or young woman in, in the show. I, yeah, I've been waiting, you know, a good 20 years for this to be turned into a DV show. So I'm really excited. I love who they cast as Moraine. Um, Rosamund Pike is perfect. It, and I'm rereading the, the first book right now, just to be like, you know, 
to be one of those people who's like, oh, well, they did that differently. Yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> in the book, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely that type of nerd. All right. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Well, I am going to put the uh, link to your travel agent, the Geek Travel Agent, in uh, and, and your Instagram, right? Because you're uh, yes. you are also on Instagram. So I'm going to put these in the episode uh, description. Is there anything I've forgotten to ask you, or something you wanted to say before I let you I, go? I think I just I wanted to let people know as well that I I take care of all types of trips. Like even you know I can book people to go to Club Med. I I take care of all, a lot of all inclusives, a little bit of cruising. So, but the geek travel stuff is like being the geek travel agent is where my heart is. Um, but I look after all my clients equally, whether they are geeks or not. Uh, and even if it's only one little, one little geeky thing to add into a bigger trip, I'm happy to help with that kind of thing, you know, either the whole trip or just the little geeky bit. Uh, and it, it really, what really matters is that if you're working with a travel agent and you're lo stay loyal to your travel agent, um, I don't want to take anybody's clients. We're not in competition with each other. Just, you know, use a travel agent, uh, especially now when there's so much information that you don't know what you don't know. And uh, yeah, if you have a, if you have a travel agent, hug them tight. Cause it's been, it's been a rough couple of years. Oh, excellent. Well, I want to really want to thank you for sharing your story, telling us about oh, my your, pleasure. Your, your business today. Well, so thank you so much for having me. No problem. And I will put all the links in your episode description. So everyone, that was Aaron Novodvorsky from the uh, Greek Geek Travel Agent. And we will see you all next week. Bye. Say bye, Aaron. Bye.